morning and welcome back. Uh, we're very happy to be here. We've got some exciting uh, news to share. Uh, I'm pleased to share that uh, TMDSAS has now welcomed its 20th member institution and the first ever School of Podiatric Medicine to the state of Texas, the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley School of Podiatric Medicine. And joining us today is uh, their fantastic uh, admissions team that is ready and eager to welcome each one of you to their school. So uh, uh, again, uh, my name is Enrique Hasso and I am the director of TMDSAS uh, here housed in the Texas Health Education Service Office in Austin, Texas. And joining us from the Rio Grande Valley, we've got, as I mentioned, the admissions team. So I'm gonna allow each of them to uh, go ahead and introduce themselves. Dr. Harkless, would you kick us off? Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Lawrence Harkless. I'm the interim dean of the School of Podiatric uh, Medicine. Uh, my name is Gilbert Morin. I am the director of admissions for the School of Podiatric Medicine. Good morning. I'm Javier Cavazos, and I am the assistant dean of curriculum and clinical education. Good morning. I am Javier Lafontaine. I'm the associate dean for academic affairs. Good morning. My name is Veronica Villarreal, and I am the Medical Education Evaluation and Assessment Manager. Great, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, for those of you watching right now, as I, uh, we'd like to remind you, this is a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions for our team here, please drop them in the comments, and we'll make sure to address those uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, to kick us off uh, first, uh, of course, we want to get the logistics out of the way of how to apply to the brand new school of podiatric medicine here. Uh, and so for TMDSAS, for this first application cycle, uh, we are accepting applications for both entry year 2022 and entry year 2023 for the UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, if you already applied as an entry year 2022 applicant, and have not been accepted at any other member institution, you just have to complete a form that's available on our website at tmdsas.com. Uh, and by completing that form, you can add the UTRGV School of Pediatric Medicine free of charge. It's included as part of your application fee. If you did not submit an entry year 2022 application yet, uh, go ahead and go to TMDSAS and start an entry year 2023 application and only add the UTRGV School of Pediatric Medicine in the select school section. Once you do that, submit a request to move your application to entry year 2022, and as part of your application fee, we'll go ahead and include you to that application cycle. If you are a current TMDSAS applicant, which is entry year 2023, and you've not yet submitted your application, you could actually just go to your select school section and add the UTRGV School of Pediatric Medicine. Uh, if you already submitted your application for entry year 2023, uh, you can submit a request on that form uh, that we mentioned. Again, it's available at tmdsas.com, and we'll go ahead and add the school for you, just as you would any other member institution, and that's included as part of your flat rate application fee through TMDSAS. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, you may only have one application open at a time. Uh, so you can't have both an entry year 2022 and an entry year 2023 application open simultaneously. The deadline for entry year 2022 is going to be July 20th. So after that fact, if you would like to apply uh, to all TMDSAS member institutions and you've already had an entry year 22 application, you can begin it the following way. So um, that concludes uh, essentially the questions about uh, how to apply and submit your application to the school. Uh, and we've already got our first message from Olivia. Uh, she's been waiting for the school to open for a while. Congratulations and thank you for holding this Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us, Olivia. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, the School of Podiatric Medicine team to uh, share some information about the school. Uh, thank you, uh, Enrique. I'm uh, Dr. Harkless as I introduce myself as the interim dean. Uh, we have a well, about 10 minutes of a presentation here with a few slides to introduce you to uh, what podiatric medicine is and why it's an important uh, profession that you should consider uh, for your uh, future. Next slide. So the goal for us is to really uh, keep America, but more importantly, keep Texas walking. Since Texas is one of the largest states in 254 counties, uh, rural, growing at an exponential rate. 
uh, podiatric medicine is important, and we did, this is the first school of podiatric medicine in the state, and it's important that we uh, inform and inspire the next generation to become podiatrists so that we can uh, indeed keep Texas uh, walking. Next slide. So what is podiatric medicine? Uh, podiatric medicine really is a regional, well, we are a regional specialist of the foot and ankle, uh, me uh, medical and surgical uh, treatment, uh, which includes uh, sports medicine, pediatrics, geriatrics, and general uh, wellness. And the foot is oftentimes considered a mirror of systemic diseases. So a lot of chronic diseases such as diabetes, uh, obesity, uh, arthritis, uh, peripheral arterial disease that's related to cardiovascular disease. And from my experience, uh, I uh, was at the University of Texas Health Science Center for many, many years, and uh, diabetes was really the, the platform that allows, allowed us to uh, grow and become a, a respected specialty within the uh, academic uh, health science center. And we do know that the diabetes is more prevalent in the, in the um, Hispanic Mexican-American populations, American Indian, as well as uh, uh, African-American. And so with those... Uh, uh, with the population of Texas growing, and I think about 38% of the population is Hispanic, and I think the percentage of uh, Hispanic podiatrists are, are, is about maybe 3% of our profession, there's a huge need and there's a significant need here in the lower Grand Van Valley. And it's a really an important part of the, uh, the medical world. I chaired a um, stream for the International Diabetic Foot Federation in 2017 in Abu Dhabi, and the president of IDF uh, elect prior to that said that the number one problem worldwide uh, for um, diabetes was foot problems. And so, uh, it's, and so we definitely need uh, podiatric medicine at the forefront as we uh, take care of the uh, citizens and the growth of, of, uh, of the population growth of Texas. Next slide. So is proper foot care important? Yes, uh, the uh, pressure on our feet uh, can easily exceed our body weight. And uh, running puts about three to four times more body weight on our feet. And uh, everything is about lifestyle, exercise, and being uh, more healthy. And that has a lot to do with what we eat and, and uh, uh, our lifestyle is important in, uh, in chronic disease and, and prevention, if you will. And, and, and so since our feet is our mode of locomotion, it's important that they remain healthy. And so it's important that you have your feet checked for your kids, just like you go get have eye checks and just basic checks uh, for other parts of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the body. And so as I mentioned earlier, the foot is a mirror of systemic disease, and I won't belabor the point since we mentioned that previously. And women have four times more as many foot problems as men. Foot problems are basically inherited, and how we walk on them over time with the inherited problems that we have will lead to disease depending on the, uh, how much we walk and the activity that we have in terms of being less sedentary are more, uh, more sedentary, if, if, if that makes sense. And the other issue is that women wear shoes. And uh, I, one of my most important talks I've ever given was uh, shoe shopping with the foot doctor. And what I realized that uh, shoes are an illusion, not a reality. And so you may have a bunion or a hammer toe or something, but if you wear appropriate shoes and uh, in, at the times when you're on your feet the most, you can probably prevent a lot of problems. So that's all part of what we do from looking at a shoe to examine the foot and tying it all again to overall uh, health of the patient. And so as a podiatrist, we can probably prevent a third of heart attacks uh, just by palpating your pulse and doing our routine questions that we tend to ask patients. Next slide. So wh uh, what is it like to become a doctor of podiatric medicine? Uh, the education of a medical specialist. So we are a regional specialist sim similar to an, uh, an ENT specialist or an oral, sur oral surgeon. Uh, would be uh, how we uh, specialize. So we we have a different degree. It's a DPM. Uh, however, we have to know everything that any medical doctor knows if we're going to take care of the foot. So we basically take the uh, same classes and learn the same uh, uh, disease processes in terms of systems and modules, uh, starting with the foundation of anatomy. It's the variety of a general practitioner. Uh, as an in internist, um, family medicine doctor, uh, they cover the entire body. So uh, we are a group of medical, a medical practice allowed the medical specialist as a uh, podiatrist. And it's, you also have the freedom of an entrepreneur, meaning that you can have your own uh, private practice. We uh, make a good living. 
and uh, you will be able to uh, generate enough income where uh, uh, you can take care of your student loans and, and all the other obligations that you may incur in the process of becoming a, a, a podiatrist. And more importantly, in this regard, uh, this is the first school in, in, a, in the state where a major university, University of Texas, decided that our uh, profession uh, is important. And because of a state school, our tuition will be uh, significantly uh, low. It's about 20000 about half of what the other uh, non-college of podiatric medicine tuition is. And so when you start looking at the debt ratio and all of that, uh, it's a really, really great opportunity. More importantly, if we look at the valley and the culture of a lot of our um, of the uh, different populations, a lot of us uh, uh, do not like to incur a lot of debt. Plus, we tend to want to stay home since uh, family is so important. So I think that that's really uh, important that you can actually remain in Texas now and become a, a great podiatrist and, and really contribute to our uh, uh, local uh, as well as uh, state communities as well as, as national. So I think those are really important points uh, that's important. Next slide. Uh, the rewards, uh, we can really take people out of pain. So something as simple as a coronary callus, uh, we will take care of that, which means that we will trim the coronary callus, but we will determine why you have it. Anybody that has a callus, there's a reason for it. And if you do a lot of walking and running and, and overuse, uh, that can become worse. And when you have chronic diseases like diabetes and loose sensation, that can end up in an ulcer and, and even a, an amputation. And so we tend to want to keep patients active. Uh, just like we go to the ophthalmology or the optometrist for eye, eye exams and, and, and checks, uh, going to a podiatrist would be uh, important from a preventative perspective because what we usually do is start looking from the uh, watch you walk, uh, look at your neck, back, hip, all the way down to your toes and feet and determine uh, if there's any abnormal, what I call normal anatomical variations that may be leading to the cause of why you may have a callus. Uh, and again, I already mentioned the financial rewarding aspects of that. Next slide. So why become a DPM? A shortage of podiatric physicians. I think I mentioned that. Aging population engaged in exercise and fitness for more injuries. People are more, are more active, as I've alluded to. We mentioned uh, arthritis. Uh, one of my uh, professors, uh, program directors, uh, felt that most of the problems that we have in, in, in athletics are malalignment problems. And uh, we're at the forefront of that in terms of the biomechanics of the why and understanding that and hopefully realigning you so that you do not develop uh, overuse syndrome such as uh, chronic knee pain, ankle pain, or even back pain can all uh, come from uh, problems with your, uh, with your feet. Uh, we mentioned diabetes and obesity. Uh, ob obesity is a, is a cumulative effect, if you will, from diabetes. When you get fat and, and you have overweight in, in the stomach, uh, the, it's an inflammatory process that actually takes place. And so when you have a obesity with diabetes, it's almost, a, as I said, a cumulative effect. I call it the double or triple whammy as relates to that. And that all leads to inflammatory changes in the, in the vasculature. And every complication with diabetes is related to blood flow. And that all has to do with uh, cardiovascular. And probably the number one cause of death uh, is, I think, that diabetes is like number five. And that's primarily related to uh, blood flow. Variety of pathology that's, seen, that's uh, curable is basically not life or death uh, in, the, uh, in the hospital. Again, we mentioned financial rewarding. And you have many, many practice options, which we will uh, cover uh, a little later in the presentation. Next slide. Uh, what are the admissions requirements? Uh, I think we'll talk about that in the, in the chat. But it requires at least a three years of uh, 90 hours of a college credit. It's the same as a, a, a regular MD medical school as it relates to the uh, basic sciences and chemistry, et cetera. And most, most of the students have a, a college degree, and uh, we require the uh, medical college admission test. And I think we'll talk about that in the, in the, uh, in the chat and uh, actually put up some more information about the admissions. I'm sure there will be many questions from, from you all as we uh, move forward. Next slide. Uh, where do we receive our medical education? Uh, where to study and why? This is a diagram of the U.S. showing where the colleges are located. And we're at number 10 here, which is UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine. And it's important because uh, we're the first in the state. Uh, the tuition is uh, uh, amenable to where anyone could afford, could afford for it to go. The Valley, uh, in terms of cost of living, is probably one of the lowest areas in the country also. And uh, we have uh, amassed a phenomenal uh, faculty as it relates to basic science, et cetera, uh, where we will be looking at uh, uh, training uh, uh, physicians for practice, for public health, physician scientists, as well as educators. 
And so um, I call it the house of medicine and you can be anything in the house of medicine, whether you're a podiatrist or, or an MD. And uh, I think I'm a living witness of all the things that can take place. And our faculty will embody all those particular aspects of, uh, of, uh, of uh, student success and mentoring and giving you the connections and how these, uh, what you can be as part of that, uh, that process. Those will be one of our major, major strengths. And, and that's really, really exciting. Next slide. Uh, these are areas where we have a podiatric residency training program. Uh, the four years of uh, medical school for, to be, obtain the DPM, in, DPM degree. That's what we can guarantee you. After that, you have three years of postgraduate training. Uh, this is a list of all of the, uh, I think, it's seven uh, residency training programs within Texas now. Uh, I used to be the program director at UT uh, San, San Antonio, and uh, we will be developing the programs here within the, uh, the Valley in terms of our affiliated uh, institutions as we speak. We were successful in passing legislation in 2019, uh, 20, yeah, 2019, no, 20 and 21, I'm sorry, uh, so that uh, podiatric medicine can participate in the state graduate medical education program. And I think that was funded at about $150 million. Uh, and they increased that about 50 the last session. So that will allow us to open up programs in, in more of the academic health centers around the country or health related institutions that are, that are, that are interested. And, uh, and that's exciting, and that's what we can, uh, UTRGV can lead uh, here in the Valley where the need is, uh, is significant. Next slide. Where do we work? Uh, most students uh, have shot at someone in practice, and they probably think that that's all you can do is go into a private practice. But uh, podiatrists work in multi-specialty clinics. Dr. LaFontaine, uh, who's uh, the academic dean here, has um, uh, worked at ADC, the Austin Diagnostic Clinic, uh, out of uh, residency uh, initially, and uh, Dr. Cavazos has uh, has has the uh, the uh, man and and uh, entrepreneur spirit, as he was a good entrepreneur in practice, and he's really from the valley, so he can really uh, talk talk to you a lot about that. Uh, academics, uh, UME, GME, and CME is uh, undergraduate medical education as students, graduates is our residents and fellows, and CME would be private practitioners, faculty and the retirees. So we hope here, we not hope, we will develop a culture of learning, you know, for, for where we'll have all of this taking place between conferences and rounds as we continue to develop the program. Uh, government, uh, VA will be affiliated with the VA here. Uh, VA trains more residents in podiatric medicine and surgery than any other uh, health-related institution. You have the Indian Health Service, IHS, Center for Disease Control, NIH, HHS. That's all the big uh, government. So you can work in, partic in those particular areas as well. And uh, it'd be great if we get some physician scientists that really want to be a uh, research scientist uh, related to diabetes and wound healing and arthritis and all different aspects. So those are things that would be interesting as well as, uh, as, well as public health. Hospitalists, uh, hospital uh, CEOs and CMOs. Uh, we have a colleague here that's the CMO of Valley Baptist. Brownsville, and I know several podiatrists over my career that have been CEOs and at the Scripps in California and Sacramento and major health systems, and then uh, at the Grant Memorial Medical Center in uh, in, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and Ohio Health. Uh, health plans, uh, again, you can work there. So I believe uh, uh, dual degrees would be important if you're interested in doing uh, academic medicine or, or, or being a leader just within healthcare. And healthcare is about, I think it's 17 to 19% of our gross domestic product. So it's a great area to be in. You never have to worry about uh, uh, having a job because uh, people can always get sick and they're going to always walk around their feet. Feet will hurt and uh, you'll always be busy. Uh, research, we mentioned physician scientists and the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we work very, very closely with the pharmaceutical industry and we had educational programs when I was in San Antonio with the pharmaceutical industry, educating some of the pharmaceutical reps and also serving on scientific advisory panel. If you're a physician scientist and you're doing research and all of that, then uh, if you're the thought leader in that area, they will seek you out uh, to serve on scientific advisory panels, et cetera. So there are, there are many areas uh, over and beyond uh, the private practice. And that's why I call it uh, you can, the Health Science Center Bowl of Soup. And again, you can be anything that you want to be. I think I'm about my last slide. Next slide. Is that the end? Yeah. Oh, what do students uh, study? First two years, uh, we have uh, basic sciences, uh, year one and two, 
And those courses include anatomy, histology, biochemistry, physiology, pharmacology, pathology. And those are primarily in uh, modules and, uh, and systems. We also have clinical skills and problem-based learning that run concurrently uh, with that. And so from a module perspective, we have what we call molecules to medicine. And that's kind of biochemistry, uh, genetics, embryology, embryology, all kind of tied into one. We have a module called attack and defense. That's microbiology and immunology. And then you have the various systems, cardiovascular, res respiratory, renal, digestive, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, we have a, one course in podiatric medicine and surgery. It's called the Podiatric Medicine Surgeon Biomechanics. And this is a longitude model in, in the first two years where we start teaching you basic about uh, problems about the foot and ankle uh, from an um, anatomical and disease perspective. And so that must make you unique from the MD curriculum is that uh, you're learning from day one uh, as a podiatrist about podiatric medicine and surgery instead of waiting after four years to go specialize in residency to learn what you plan to be. And so that's the, that's the difference. And so as a podiatrist, we spend more time studying the foot than anybody else in medicine. It didn't take me long as an intern in San Antonio in 1975 that I knew more than anybody about feet. When I got there, I was always concerned about that, the, that could I measure up and did I know enough. But clearly, uh, I was there to learn like everybody else. And here I am today uh, doing well. Third and fourth years, we do clinical rotations, uh, skills in hospitals and clinics, including internal medicine, family medicine, general surgery, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll do three months of medicine and three months of surgery in the third year of getting the overall experience that you need to, to, to be a podiatric uh, physician and surgeon. Next, residencies, uh, biomechanics and surgery, and again, it's three years. Next slide. And we also have fellowships. Uh, this is uh, uh, not required, but uh, many of us want to uh, be more specialized. And so you can have, uh, there are many fellowships in diabetic foot, a limb salvage, they call it wound healing, et cetera, amputation prevention, if you will. Sports medicine is a great area. Uh, the UTRGV has a Division I athletic team, so we'll have a gate lab. Uh, we'll be working with the uh, human performance within the UTRGV as well, and hopefully we'll be able to get data and do some great research in those particular areas, pediatrics, geriatrics, and surgery. On the surgery, you can do trauma, reconstruction, uh, AO, which is the plates and screws and frames that you put on, as well as uh, limb deformity. And uh, there are also imaging and well as infectious disease uh, fellowships. And one of our goals is to create some additional fellowships and, and create a critical mass of academicians, if you will, for those who are interested in being educators and academicians uh, for, uh, for our profession. Uh, I think that's the end. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, share very quickly with you kind of an overview of uh, podiatric medicine. Even at my age of almost uh, 45 years of doing podiatric medicine and surgery, I'm as excited as I was, I think, on the uh, on day one. So you have a bright future. We look forward to your uh, applications. And uh, uh, Enrique, I'll uh, turn it back over to you for uh, in entertain some questions. And thanks a lot uh, for allowing us to participate. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Harkless, for, for the uh, real quick overview of uh, uh, what this career path looks like and, and really the significance of having a school of podiatric medicine here in the state of Texas. It's a really, really exciting opportunity for the state. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come into the chat, so we're going to go ahead and dig into those. Again, uh, as, you're, uh, as you're watching this session, please feel free to uh, send us your questions. We've got the team here to address those. Uh, that's why they're here. Uh, so any questions that you might have about this career path, about the academic path and preparation, or what it takes to be a competitive applicant, send us your questions now. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with uh, Ariana Ruiz's question. Uh, thank you for the information. Uh, thank you for this informative session, rather. How will students be evaluated academically? Will it be a pass-fail system? Also, will there be a minimum MCAT score? And just uh, for those of you watching who may be asking, like, what do you mean by pass-fail? Uh, for our medical schools, uh, recently their, uh, uh, their board exams have gone to pass-fail for uh, the Step 1 USMLE exam. So I believe that might be the context of our next question there. Uh, uh, hand it I, off to you all. Yeah, I, I could probably answer that question. Uh, pertaining to the uh, grading system, uh, our courses will be pass fail, but it'll have four categories. It'll be pass with honors, uh, high pass, uh, pass, and, and fail. Uh, each one of those uh, grading systems will be determined 
uh, by a range of, of, of scores. 90 to 100, for example, would be a high honors. Uh, 90 to 80 would be a, a pass uh, or a high pass, et cetera. Uh, and then grade points uh, will be, or uh, a, a weighted point scale will be graded, will be assigned to each grade, which uh, will easily, uh, will allow us easily to convert into a grade point average, uh, which could uh, and will be necess a necessity as you proceed into the um, uh, residency program uh, uh, process. Uh, Gilbert, you want to respond to the MCAT score or, or Dr. LaFontaine? Sure, I, I can respond. Um, for the MCAT scores, we're looking at a minimum of 485. Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies in correlation with the MCAT scores and also with uh, GPAs, and it tends to be that uh, students with higher MCAT scores have a higher probability of being successful in the program. So the higher, the better, but for the minimum, at least a 485 is what we're looking for, okay? All right, thank you so much. Uh, onward to our next question from Philip. Uh, he's on his phone right now, but he had a question. Uh, he's had some trouble achieving more than an exceptional score on the MCAT. No idea what exceptional means, but we're gonna take a, a shot at that. Uh, would having a background as a paramedic and having a master's degree in biology help one's chances for matriculation? And so I think there's a question regarding holistic review of an application. Uh, so I'll let you all answer that. Yeah, I can I can take this one. Uh, Philip, thank you for sending this, this question. I mean, we are trying to get a holistic approach to um, for 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 the student or the candidate that are applying. You know, so um, there are obviously some minimum criteria that 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 we have to accept students, but um, we don't want you as a candidate either to limit yourself, you know, because we know life is things happen in life. And maybe, you know, you didn't do well in the first two years and the last two years you did great, but your GPA didn't come up really high, you know, or you have this excellent GPA, but your MCAT were that good. You know, we, we realize people, candidates like that, are, you know, we at least should review them, interview them and, potentially become a doctor, you know, you have a master's degree, maybe you perform out outstanding in there that that might level out some of the other inconveniences during your bachelor degree. So I would encourage you to to still apply. I mean, I think is we're looking at a holistic approach uh, when when we're trying to evaluate this candidate. So so don't limit yourself. Great, thank you. We did get a quick follow-up from Philip. He, he did get an MCAT higher than the 485. So uh, I think uh, uh, Gilbert, Gilbert answered that question. Earlier. It, it, yeah. If I can just add a comment, you know, and I know that we live in a society that we like to follow metrics. You know, I, I, I recently had a son that, that went through the whole college process and they're so overly concerned about, you know, in that case, uh, SATs and grade point averages. And we, we all recognize that all that is important, but just to kind of reiterate Dr. LaFontaine's point, we are looking for a holistic approach and we're gonna look at the candidate in total. Uh, so so please, if, if you're like right under the, the a minimum of something, don't let that discourage you. We will take you through the process. We will evaluate it. Uh, we, will have, we will have a very, very uh, diverse uh, faculty and uh, admissions committee that, that has wide experiences in uh, higher education uh, and we understand all the different uh, uh, components of selecting optimum candidates. So I, I know metrics are important, but, but you know, I think that the overall picture and it, as you see yourself as a candidate should not discourage you. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have a follow-up question from Ariana. Uh, will the first two years of classes be integrated with the MD students at UTRGV School of Medicine, or will podiatry students have their own classes? Yeah, let me let me answer that as the uh, assistant dean of curriculum. Uh, our curriculum now is, uh, or the School of Podiatric Medicine will strictly be an autonomous school uh, located on a, on a on a different campus than the School of Medicine. Uh, so the all uh, basic science faculty and all podiatric medicine faculty that is affiliated and associated with the School of Podiatric Medicine are strictly 
uh, School of Podiatric Medicine faculty, the curriculum, uh, although we uh, um, uh, utilize the School of Medicine uh, curriculum as a as a reference, uh, I can assure you that that the the uh, podiatric curriculum is strictly podiatric curriculum founded on the learning objectives uh, that are set forth by our profession and those that will best uh, prepare you uh, for success in, in, in your uh, boards uh, and in your careers. So uh, it is not integrated with MD students. Uh, uh, it will be a strictly autonomous uh, class with fellow podiatry students. Excellent, thank you. So we're gonna take a quick step back since a lot of questions are around holistic review and, and what that looks like for the school. Uh, could we talk a little bit more about what the mission for the school is? We've had this discussion with the other TMDCS member institutions and you know we've gone over how the mission of a school influences the admissions process for the type of applicants uh, they're looking for as well as the curriculum and pretty much everything that the school does. So. Uh, would you mind sharing some insights on that? Let, let, let me read it out and then we, I can have the panel to kind of discuss how we, uh, we came about it. So the UTRGV School of Podiatric uh, Me uh, Medicine's mission statement is that the SOPM will foster success or foster student success, I should say, by inspiring, educating, and developing a diverse, uh, compassionate student body fully preparing them for podiatric residency training, but also becoming dedicated podiatric physicians, research scientists, public health professionals, and educators. So we took a lot of time to kind of try to define uh, what our mission and our purpose would be. And we can assure you that primarily student success really is the foundation. Student success is the center of, of everything that we intend to do at this uh, School of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, and that will be through mentoring and education. Uh, but we want you to develop and utilize this, this time as your laboratory to uh, not only receive excellent podiatric education training, but really you as an individual learn and figure out what exactly you 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 want to be and what path you want to take as a podiatric physician. Dr. Harkless mentioned a lot of potential avenues, uh, and we've touched up on all of these in our mission statement. Uh, but it's really going to be a time for exploration uh, for you students, so that you're able to figure out what really fits you and your needs. Uh, and I'll, I'll open it up to the rest of the panel to just kind of add on 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 those uh, topics. Yeah, I, I think that is a, an important uh, question for all the participants to understand. You know, one of the great things of being a podiatrist has been the ability for you that after you get your training to, to practice just a wide variety of things. Just because you're the expert on the foot and ankle doesn't mean you have to be in the office, right? We still do a lot of research. You can teach. You can be a strictly a surgeon in your practice. You can be a strictly a medical practitioner when it comes to the foot and ankle care, or you can have kind of a hybrid practice. You can work in pharmaceutical or industry like Dr. Hartley was mentioning. But the school, the foundation of your education has to prepare you for every single opportunity you may have when you leave. And that's basically what it is. You know, so just like Dr. Cavazos was saying, the fact that, you know, we we are here to expose, you know, the can the student to all 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 the opportunities you might have, and to be able to move on into residency training with that perspective and and further develop those skills. So so again, it, it's all about student success. That's what we want to make sure that that any candidate that decide to apply to UTRGV, we are here to, you know, we're training colleagues, okay? We, we're past the biology major student or education major. We're here to train colleagues. So uh, we are facilitator of your education for, for, for the future that, that you want for yourself. Excellent. I love how you said that, that you're training your future colleagues. I think that's a, an aspect of, 
health education that a lot of aspiring students kind of miss. So thank you very much yep. for, for sharing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, we have a few more questions and we will get to your questions, but uh, uh, if you have those in the chat, we will get to those, but we uh, wanna make sure we address these first. Um, what kind of qualities are you looking for in a competitive applicant? So uh, Gilbert brought up, you know, the MCAT requirement a little bit earlier for a qualified applicant, but what makes an applicant competitive? I mean, I, um, I, I think, uh, is that okay if I answer part yeah. of it, uh, Gilbert? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, from, I just gonna take instead of the standard uh, criteria were that we have. I, I let Gilbert elaborate on those. But if I would see you as a, uh, and I would tell you what is make a competitive applicant, you have to put yourself if you if you ever been a patient, or you ever taken a relative to be a patient, and you leave the office and say, you know, I really like this doctor. That's what make you a competitive applicant. Okay, because the GPA, the MCAT going to get you an interview. But if you don't show you can be a good doctor, doesn't really matter what your MCAT is, right? I mean, you can even complete the degree. You can complete residency training. But if you're simply not a good doctor, you ain't going to be successful. Okay, so to me, just think it that way. You have to be... Uh, you know, you have to be obviously competent in what you do. You'd have to stay on top of, of, you know, medicine is evolving. So you need to stay on top of that, but you need to be personable. You need to be friendly. You need to be understanding. Those are just innate qualities. You need to be a competitive applicant. You do that. Then the MCAT, the GPA, all that. It's going to assure you you get an opportunity to become a doctor, and I let Gilbert elaborate on 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 those other metrics. If before we get to the metrics, Gilbert, could I just add on something there? You know, we like one of the things that we as as the people that are going to do the assessment process, we 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 always believe that we want to be as transparent and we want to give you the roadmap to success. We we never have any intention. Of, of hiding. So anytime, for instance, uh, that we go through our curricular process and you receive your syllabi, one of the first things that all our faculty is going to do is going to pretty much highlight you or point you in the direction of what the learning objectives will be so that you keep everybody accountable. You'll keep our faculty accountable. You'll keep yourself accountable. And you'll you'll know the roadmap. You'll know where we where you're going or where we want you to go right from, 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 from day one. So So what I wanted to say about that is that a, a, a key component of medical education is the progression, which is very, very different than other academia, uh, in that the progression from the cognitive to the skills to the application of a physician. And, and, and that is a, a progression and process that all medical education students will go from year one through year four. We understand that at the beginning, everybody's about the didactics and acquiring knowledge and memorizing and remembering knowledge, but eventually that knowledge needs to be applied. And then you need to add those, those skill sets, uh, the, 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 those, those skills expected of a physician that Dr. LaFontaine mentioned to ultimately be a successful graduate, a successful resident, and a su successful physician. And, and, and that's how we're going to assess. So th the assessment process is really how every student progresses in that continuum. So, so knowing what, how you will be ex assessed throughout the continuum, you can start to understand what we will be looking, what are some of the skills that, what are some of the characteristics and attributes that we feel will give you success in accomplishing that progression being personable, you know, having experience with, with, uh, uh, and interactions, uh, through your, your extracurriculars, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that has demonstrated or showed you compassion. And, and a lot of, a lot of this, you'll be able to be able to inform us 
through that secondary application process where you're able to really open up yourselves to us and open up that window so that we can really, really dive. Because yes, we will look at the metrics, but we want, we want all our students to be success. And there are certain attributes and characteristics that can predict success in medical education. Uh, go ahead, Gilbert. Be you before can Gilbert, before yeah. Gilbert, can I make one comment? <laughs> I, I have one word, Enrique, and it's called service. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you all summarized it quite eloquently. Yes, absolutely. Uh, all that was great information. Um, but what qualities are we looking for when it, uh, for candidates to be uh, competitive or what they need to have? Um, for the basics right now, uh, what we're looking is for applicants to have um, the minimum requirement. That's number one. OK, um, you know, everything else is a bonus. But uh, along the lines is, you know, relevant experience, as Dr. Cavazos was mentioning, um, your application materials. Uh, we want to make sure that you're going to be a great fit uh, for the program and we want to prepare you for success in the program. Um, relevant skills as well as an important factor, you know, your writing abilities. Um, so these are options where you're going to be able to show us on the secondary application is your writing abilities and organization as well on how you write uh, your essays. It's just gonna allow us just to gauge us uh, how you're gonna be uh, in, the, in the program or how successful you'll be in the program. Uh, and of course, attention to detail. Other things that we'll be looking for as well is community service. Are you actively engaged or have you been actively engaged within your commission and within your community? Um, learning, um, you know, are you still con continuing your education or have you pursued past your undergraduate further education um, and your leadership abilities? You know, what experience does you have? Have you been a part of, you know, professional organizations? All of these show that your interests in, in being successful in life. And that's what we will ultimately want to prepare for, for our applicants. Um, so it's, it, and it all goes back to looking at, at the holistic uh, approach that we'll be taking. So uh, whatever barrier uh, that you feel that you may not meet um, by no means or, or manner, um, should it discourage you from submitting in your application? I would strongly submit your application if you, if you show that interest in. I think we got some excellent advice there for anybody interested in pursuing this pathway. Uh, everything that you've heard uh, today is uh, I'm taking it to heart because this is exactly, they just gave you the key of how to get accepted to the school. All right, let's go ahead and dig into uh, some of uh, the other questions that we have uh, prepared for our panel today. Um, this one should be a pretty quick one. Uh, what is the entering class size? So, entering entering yeah. class size is going to be 40 students. We're hoping to fill the 40 slots um, given the applicant pool. That's why uh, we're encouraging everybody that has that interest to submit their application in. Great. And again, uh, if you are interested in starting at the UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine this fall, uh, submit your application by July 20th. Uh, it's still an opportunity for you to join the class, the inaugural class. And for uh, entry year 2023, this, uh, will the class also be 40? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Well, uh, of course, that's a setup question because we have already gotten a question uh, from our chat. Uh, since the program has a, a spots for 40 applicants, uh, how many are being uh, reserved for out-of-state applicants? Or how are out-of-state applicants being considered? 10%. So the math is right, it's four. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay, and then uh, we have a, another follow-up question about entry year 2023 from Briar. Uh, what is the application deadline for entry year 2023? And I believe that's November, is it November 15th? Correct me if I'm wrong. November 1st. So it's November the, 1st, okay. The next deadline as our as a medical and dental applicants, yeah. November 1st for entry yeah. year 23. We also have a question from Olivia. Let's see which one we can tackle here. Um, uh, this is a question about how interviews will be performed uh, for this first class. Will they be face to face in person or virtual? The interviews are going to be held virtually via Zoom. Um, 
So if you're selected for an interview, you're guaranteed the date, but not the time. So um, we recommend that you block off that entire day. Um, uh, interviewees uh, will have two interviews to complete. One's going to be an open interview and one's going to be a blind interview. Uh, we do uh, require for all interviewees to have a valid picture ID. You're going to take this uh, the, your picture ID. Uh, state issued government passport, um, you know, naturalization card, and you're going to post it or, or you know, um, raise it up to the camera so the interviewer can can see uh, your identification and make sure it is it is you. And it's a 30 minute interview, and both of them will be in the same day. Excellent, thank you. All right, we uh, have about. Uh, just under 15 minutes left in the session. So again, if you have any questions for our panel, uh, send them in now and we will make sure to address them. Uh, let's, we, we've gone over uh, the importance of what it means to have a school of, podi uh, of podiatric medicine in the state of Texas and what a great opportunity that is for addressing the various healthcare needs of the state. We've talked about the admissions process and what kind of applicants uh, are going to be uh, considered, uh, not just considered, but competitive for this pool. So now let's dig into uh, kind of more of the gray areas, if we could, uh, in terms of what kind of uh, challenges uh, you anticipate uh, students or uh, practitioners of podiatric medicine, uh, what kind of challenges they're going to face and any advice on what uh, they can do to conquer those? What kind of programming do you all have to help support those students? Yeah, I mean, I um, our you know we have built the school um, around what we discussed earlier about student success, right? So um, we have used that we have take advantage of being really integrated with the UT Rio Grande Valley institution. So basically, any any of the services you have uh, encountered when you were in college, we you know we're gonna be part of it you know so we're the count the, for example the advising we're still gonna use the faculty to do that um you know if you have any go through rough time and you need you know mental health uh, uh you know counseling we're gonna use the utrgb uh, uh, resources for now and eventually we're gonna transition to have our own person in, in the harlingen campus um, you know, if you, you know, if you need, um, uh, ideas on, you know, how to be effectively with organization, organizational skills, uh, time management, uh, any, any of those, of, of those parameters, again, we're going to have the, the, our director of student services, uh, will be, you know, a partner, you know, working together with the main parent institution to provide all those services. So obviously as you become a doctor and as you train to become a doctor, there's gonna be challenges, right? The, there's gonna be a lot of material, you know, load of material change it's gonna be a lot. You're gonna go overwhelming, overwhelm, you know, in, in many situations. So, so we're gonna surround the student with all those available services for you to have. And not only as an option, but we're gonna make sure that that they're, that you know they're there, you know, so you can you, you can have access to it. Um, I, I think we we are, you know, the faculty is, uh, we're engaged. Um, we, we, we're gonna be engaged with you all and uh, we're gonna make sure that, that you get the most of, every opportunity to, to finish this degree. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So as we uh, begin kind of, uh, did I hear somebody? Nope, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, as we begin kind of winding down today's session, uh, let's take some time to address maybe that one high school student who we just caught and they're extremely excited to pursue this pathway to become a podiatrist uh, down the line. What advice do you uh, have to offer an aspiring podiatrist as they prepare for this career path? Maybe not currently applying, but maybe will be applying, you know, four, five, ten years from now. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great question, Rick. I think um, the the best the best thing the first thing I would do is identify a podiatrist in your community and and spend some time with them. You know, take you know couple hours a you know couple hours a week. You know, maybe you know couple hours a month if you're really young. You're trying to determine what what you really need to do. You know, take a day on during your summer. And just you know, spend it so you really know what we're doing. I mean, the bottom line is you are a foot and ankle specialist. So the first thing you have to come to term is am I okay treating the foot and the ankle forever? Right? And and if it uses for yourself that you can do that, then you're you are in the right path. Just remember, this is a profession that you can practice right medicine and surgery and many of the other things that we talked about is subspecialized from the get going so you are learning foot and ankle from the beginning and then your residence is three years right so it's short compared to if you want to become a general surgeon right it's five years or you want to become a plastic surgeon it's seven years right so it's a subspecialized medicine to so the foot and ankle where you can practice medicine and surgery and it's shorter than the traditional medical uh, practices or medical education. And you can get a good living and do many other things. So if you do that, you get exposed to that early and so you can feel comfortable. So by the time you become an applicant, you know this is really what you want to do. Yeah, I would I would like to add that I, I agree with Dr. Lafontaine, but I, I'd probably even take it a step further and to visit multiple DPMs to get a, 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 a wider scope of what everything is available to you. As Dr. Lafontaine, this this profession is has extreme diversity. Uh, some focus a lot on diabetic foot management and infection, wound care, others do sports medicine and participate with uh, either university or professional athletes. Uh, there'll be obviously fellowship opportunities to get you to that level. Um, others do primary care where they are content uh, dealing, the, dealing with the geriatric population. Uh, others like to do uh, dermatology. Other, other podiatrists do strictly pediatric. Uh, so get as much diversity uh, from different types of podiatrists so that you begin to gather uh, a, a, a knowledge base of what all it entails and what are the common denominators and what is difference. And I think that at the end of the day, you'll, you'll come to the realization that, that it's great. Uh, uh, there's a great income potential. There's a great work-life balance. Uh, and um, you, know, you can do quite well with this profession and have a significant status in your community as well as in the medical profession. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for those uh, thoughtful responses. Hopefully that, that one high school student out there listening uh, takes that advice to heart. And this is a, a great pathway and, and, and worthwhile. Uh, moving in closer to those that are currently applying, uh, we do uh, want to share some resources that are available to you on the brand new uh, website for uh, UTRGV School of Podiatric Medicine. And uh, Gilbert, would you mind kind of walking us through, uh, let me make sure I get the right tab this time. Uh, one second. Uh, so here, if you could walk us through the, the requirements. Oh, Gilbert, you're muted. <laughs> So applicants must have completed a minimum of 90 semester credit hours, as uh, Dr. Harkless was mentioning, or 135 uh, quarter hours, including the minimum credits. Um, now, the minimum credits uh, for biology is eight semester credit hours or the 12 uh, credit hours. In order to get the uh, some institutions use the 12 uh, quarter hour format, um, basically um, the way to determine the, the credit hour. In this case, you'll, you'll just divide that number by 1.5. Um, for general inorganic chemistry, eight semester hours or 12 um, credit hours, uh, semester hours. 
uh, organic chemistry, eight semester hours or 12 uh, quarter hours, uh, physics, eight semester hours or 12 quarter hours. Now, when it comes to the English uh, portion, um, we're doing some updates to our websites regarding the requirements. Um, so we're going to be allowing uh, English uh, and communications a minimum of six to eight uh, semester hours or 12 uh, quarter hours. The statistics portion of it, we went ahead and updated this uh, to make it optional. OK, um, you must have a minimum uh, GPA requirement of at least a 3.0 and the last 60 credit hours towards your degree and also a minimum of 3.2 GPA um, on all prerequisite science courses, which includes bi biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, as we mentioned numerous times in this meeting, uh, we're gonna be using a holistic review uh, process to ensure that um, um, we're looking at all of your, all of your um, experiences and all of your materials and give you the, the best opportunity to securing a seat here. Uh, for the MCAT uh, minimum score, we left it, um, you know, uh, pretty basic here, uh, but minimum what we're looking for is about a 485. <clears throat> Other things as uh, far as for uh, matriculation requirements, applicants that that do have a misdemeanor com uh, conviction will be reviewed by a special subcommittee. And of course, applicants with a felony conviction will not be considered for admissions. And the reason for that is uh, due to licensing. Uh, now, essential abilities and technical standards. Uh, if uh, you're selected um, for um, for the upcoming year uh, as part of our inaugural class, um, there are some technical standards that you will have to acknowledge uh, on this board. Um, and letters of recommendations. Two letters of recommendations um, that's going to basically uh, include one from a uh, not a podiatric physician, we went ahead and removed that, but a professional reference and one letter from a prior academic instructor. And shadowing experience, we know that this process uh, for admissions right now is going to be an accelerated. Uh, it's going to go very fast paced, so please pay attention to your emails. Um, we're going to make the shadowing experience optional this year. Um, you know, if you have it, great. Uh, if you don't, that's not a problem. Don't be discouraged on not submitting in your application. So, uh, again, I, I do encourage everybody to submit their application. Um, you know, just uh, submit it in there. Uh, of course, pay attention to detail when you submit it uh, because our admissions committee is going to be uh, looking at that. And that's just one of the things that we'll be looking at as an organization. You know, one of the other things too, Enrique, is that if, if the applicant, for whatever reason, you know, you're approaching the deadline and you're, you know, and you're still waiting for that letter of recommendation, you know, so submit the application. We, we need those letter of recommendation by the time we make a decision. So, so move, you know, you can move forward on that and you know to make sure you kind of meet the deadline but once we make a decision we we will need those letter recommendations perfect just so uh, one thing really quick as well um if you're offered a seat or even if you're interested in uh, a uh with the program moving forward uh i want to provide our federal school code for the fafsa application um, and if y'all have something to, to write with it's going to be zero zero three five nine nine that is our federal uh, school code for the fafsa applications in order to receive financial assistance all right we're going to have included that on here and then of course if any questions come up uh the website uh utrgv slash uh, utrgv.edu slash SOPM will take you to this page. And of course, if you have any questions, the email and contact information is available here as well as on the TMDSAS website to reach this team. Excellent. So we have uh, just under a minute left. Uh, any uh, final pieces of advice we'd like to share to current or prospective applicants? Well, I hope I hope that um, you know we that we have presented enough information to answer all your question and and kind of uh, take the message that 
podiatric medicine is, you know, it's a, it's a great profession and it's a, it's in great need for the state of Texas and the, you know, United States in general. So hopefully we'll see some applicants coming out of this. I hope to see everybody's application. Yep. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, uh, again, Dr. Cavazos, uh, Gilbert, Veronica, Dr. LaFontaine, Dr. Harkless, thank you all so much for taking the time to answer all of these questions and sharing some uh, exciting insights into what it means to finally have a school of podiatry here in Texas. Absolutely. As we saw on that map, uh, not it, this, this school's reach is going to definitely exceed Texas. Uh, there's just such an incredible need uh, for healthcare practitioners uh, in, in Texas and the region, uh, both in the state and, and nationally. So thank you all so much for, for sharing your important work. Uh, and on behalf of the UT Rio Grande, uh, UT Rio, uh, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley uh, School of Podiatric Medicine, uh, the Texas Medical and Dental Schools Application Service, and the Texas Health Education Service, we wish each one of you all the best of luck on your process as you build your application, build a competitive, compelling application to really tell your story. Uh, and at any point, if you need any help, uh, you know how to reach the folks at UTRGV SOPM and uh, us here at TMDSA. So thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any questions after the fact, uh, please uh, do send us an email, info at tmdss.com. And again, we look forward to seeing your applications. Thank, thank you so you. much for joining us. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you.